Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Megan Tennant and today we are talking about world building clothing. I know most of us are writers and readers don't tend to have the patience to sit through pages and pages of clothing description, unfortunately, but there are some times where you can sneak in a little bit to impress people and clothing is just fun to talk about. So we're talking about world building clothing today. So way back in the day, humans didn't bother with clothing. It was a slow evolution from ape-like ancestor to human. It's not like someone jabbed us with a genome-altering needle, handed us a loincloth, and sent us on our way. Or was it? But no, that's not what our evidence suggests. Rather, our evidence suggests that early humans did just walk around naked. This was because early humans lived in Africa where it was warm enough all year round that you didn't actually have to wear clothes. Though little did our ancestors know, UV radiation is a thing and it is not a good thing. And losing all of our fur meant we had no protection from the big ball of light in the sky, which is a little bit of a problem it turns out. But as much as we'd like to flatter ourselves and think that we made this discovery and that's how clothing got invented, we did not. We just <laughs> died. And then good old evolution stepped in and solved the problem for us by boosting up our melanin production, resulting in the darker skin tones that you see throughout Africa and around the equator. So the first clothing emerged when humans migrated from Africa to other parts of the world where the climate was colder, which is where the melanin started to evolve out of us because it wasn't as necessary. So ultimately we can credit cold weather for the creation of clothing. And eventually we did develop stabbing devices and other pointy, throwy objects. And then an embarrassing amount of time later, we realized that clothing could protect us from that as well. Cool, you still with me? No? Perfect. So what this tells us is how important necessity is to clothing. We only change things when we have very good reason to, which means the first thing you need to ask yourself is why do your characters really need clothes? And I know you might be thinking their main purpose is for them to not be naked, but I mean like think about it more deeply than that. Is the clothing there for fashion? Is it there for protection? Stop and write down exactly what clothing types you need, and I mean only the ones you need. As tempting as it is to go and design a whole array of costumes for intergalactic space strippers, unless your character is an intergalactic space stripper, which by the way, I would read the hell out of that book, or unless you happen to have a scene where your main character is running through an intergalactic space stripper place and happen to trip because they're distracted because of this costume of like crisscrossing material that seems to be adhered to her skin and it's glowing and it's crisscrossing all over her body but somehow still covering nothing at all and he's distracted and you're gonna get super distracted too if you try to go and develop costumes for intergalactic space strippers. Sad times, I know, but we gotta only do the world building for things we need. Take out a pen and paper, not as sexy, I know and write down what types of clothing you need to develop based on what's going to be present in your story. Speaking of which, World Anvil would be a really cool place to keep track of this stuff because that would allow you to create an item which could be an item of clothing and also you could then from that item reference things like professions, rank, spells, rituals, all sorts of things that you would otherwise have to copy that information over and over again. This allows you to just reference those different items in a really really convenient to access way. So some things that you might end up with on your list are formal wear, swimwear, Tom, because Tom is a weirdo and his clothes need to show it, armor, ceremonial garb, armor specially made for space strippers because that person who tripped ended up teaming up with the space strippers because you just know that those girls are badasses and I am already writing this story in my head. I wanna write it, I'm gonna write it. No, no, I don't have time to write it. Why is being a writer so hard? Moving away from that whole topic, the next thing that you're gonna wanna think about is your limiting factors. You need to draw the box into which your ideas are going to need to fit. And yes, sometimes you can think like a cat and pretend it fits and sits anyway, even though it's very obvious that you're going outside of the boundaries and no one actually thinks you fits. But knowing the boundaries is important because that will tell you how far you can push them before they break. 
First things first, we have weather and climate. This is by far one of the most important things that you're gonna wanna consider, and it includes everything from temperature to temperature fluctuations, humidity, chance of rain or snow or other body wetting events. Are there seasons where there's bioluminescent pollen storms and the pollen sticks to people's clothes and it attracts acid drooling insects? Are there magical mists that have strange clothing altering effects? Basically, you need to consider what damage and effects the environment is going to have on the clothing. For example, I lived in Costa Rica for seven years, so I know from experience that if your characters live in a human environment, they cannot use leather as their primary material source because leather is a very porous material. It will absorb all of the water and it will get little mildew mold spots all over it and it is just not a good time. Which brings us straight into our next limiting factor, which is resources. For example, China fell into the practice of silk clothing because according to legend, a cocoon fell into a cup of tea around 2696 BC and it unraveled and they found out that it made strong threads. If silkworms weren't super common in the area, the likelihood of that event happening falls to astronomically low levels. Egyptians had flax growing all over the place, so they developed linen. Our ancient ancestors were always murdering furry little animals, so they had dead animal skins laying all over the place. And one day, some weirdo was like, I'm gonna take this empty husk of an animal and put it on my skin. And the other cave people were like, Tom, why are you like this? But then Tom got super hot and Tom was like, whoa, I can survive winter now. And then everyone else wanted to be like Tom. So hey, be weird because that's how trends are born. Be like Tom. I mean, preferably without wearing dead animals because we don't need to do that anymore. So ask yourself what materials are most readily available to your people. If your characters live in a world full of giant spiders, they could probably get access to enough spider silk to make clothing out of it. I am literally just now learning that Seattle has a spider season, so I could legit harvest enough spider silk from the walls of my house right now that I could construct a very tiny hat that I could then fail to get one of the cats to wear. And that is horrifying, and no, I am not okay. One of my all-time favorite examples of this is Horizon Zero Dawn. I mean, of the resource availability thing, not of tiny hats for cats made out of spider silk. But in Horizon Zero Dawn, mech animals are a thing. And so because of this, the people have access to scrap metal and scrap plastics. And they incorporate this into their clothing, both as design elements and also more commonly as armor. Likewise, you have to consider lack of resources. In Horizon Zero Dawn, the largest living biological animal around is the boar. That's the largest piece of leather that they're gonna have access to. Or was it? It rubs the lotion on its skin or- No, 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 no. And also take into account availability of things like dyes and the metals that would make up the zippers and the buttons. If your people live on a spaceship, they don't have a lot of resources to make frivolous things like jewelry. So maybe they end up with jewelry that involves things like cogs and gears. Another really great example of this is How to Train Your Dragon 3, where they make armor out of the shed scales from dragons, and that their armor is allowing them to save other dragons. It's just a good way to show the knitting of these two communities and the way that that's ultimately helped them. So that is always an option too, is you can have your culture grow close to another culture and they can trade resources. And then of course you have the limiting factor of your genre and story itself. For example, if you're writing something that you're calling historical fantasy and you have real life names and places and events, your readers and viewers will expect you to have researched the clothing of that time and they'll expect you to represent it accurately. Rain, a loosely historical CW drama, gets tons of praise for the beautiful dresses and costume design but they also get tons of complaints because the costume design is not at all what people would have worn at that time. Next up, thing to consider, social factors. And the first item on our list is color interpretation. Color psychology is currently a credible and accepted field, and color research is on the rise, mostly because companies wanna know how best to make us buy products. Ever notice how prominent red and yellow is in things like fast food company logos? It blew my mind. No, 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 
no, no, no. Red makes us think of simulations like appetite and hunger and draws the eye. And to counter the undertones of aggression, we have yellow, which brings to mind happiness and trust and loyalty. Color has deep ties to us as humans, so you need to decide what those ties are for your people. If you have an alien race or a fantasy race, odds are they're gonna have different interpretations for color. Maybe their blood is blue and their sky is red, so they associate the color red with calmness and the color blue with aggression. Or maybe they have a sacred flower that has signature black pollen and so their clothing that they wear to get married or mated is black and maybe they have a history of a plague in their culture that one of the symptoms is it turns the victim's skin completely white, so their color of mourning is white. The roadblock you're gonna hit here is that 99% of your readers are human and will tie their own meanings to the colors you describe unless you shed light on why it's different from what we're used to. Next up, we have view on skin exposure. This one is pretty important as it'll greatly impact your designs. If your people view nudity as something taboo, odds are they'll wear more layers even if they're in a hot climate. Whereas if your people link skin display to some socially desirable trait like confidence, odds are they'll find a way to show their body more even in a harshly cold climate. So in sci-fi, this could mean that they wear sort of see-through layers. Or in maybe a fantasy setting, this could mean that they tend to keep the insides of buildings very hot and people have easy to shed layers where underneath they're wearing things that cover less. If your people have strong views on skin exposure, odds are they'll find little ways around the common limiting factors. Though it's also worth considering that the limiting factors present as your people developed could have ultimately influenced their view on nudity. Next up, comfort versus appearance. In the US, a preference towards comfort is massively on the rise, which has led to development of clothing like jeggings, which just full on evolved into leggings, which are the best because I work from home, so that's all I wear all day because I don't have to look good for anyone. You can't see my bottom half. I could be naked from the waist down and you wouldn't even know. I mean, I'm not, but I could be. But most notably, these things can be worn in a way that's considered fashionable because our perceptions of fashion shifted to accommodate this new preference towards comfort. Next up, we have design elements. What things does your culture most connect to? If your people's culture surrounds things like water or the ocean, odds are their designs will incorporate things like fish scales or seashells or waves. Maybe your people originated on another planet, so what they do to kind of pay homage to their ancestry is they all wear like a little metal ball that inside contains a stone from their home planet. I think Avatar The Last Airbender is a good example of this done very well. Firebenders have a connection to fire, so reds and dark reds are very prominent in their clothing. But they also have sharp edges and angles which kind of more reflects their views and beliefs. Whereas Water Nation, on the other hand, is all blues and whites and has more curves and flow to it. Something we even see in Katara's hair design with the loopies. And this sort of represents their kind of softer nature and the way their bending is more tied to healing. I feel like both of these do a great job at representing the people's beliefs and embodying their bending. Next up, laws and politics. Some fashions and trends can be directly influenced by regulations. In the 12th century in what is now modern France, it was declared that prostitutes couldn't wear veils. And so because of that, tearing a woman's veil was effectively calling her a whore. And you can also play around with the concept of companies putting money in the right pockets to get clothing that competitors rely on banned. And clothing can also be a political statement in itself and can be used to show allegiance to a particular belief or group. All right, so now let's look at a couple outlying clothing types that kind of break out of the norm. First off, formal wear, which also kind of encompasses higher class wear. The most important aspect of designing formal wear is it has to be something that no one would bother with on a daily basis. So either hard to put on, inconvenient or uncomfortable to wear, hard to maintain, or maybe it gets in the way of work or day-to-day -day labor. Basically, there has to be a reason that people don't just look 
hot all the time. Think of ties that basically strangle the wearer, or shapewear, which is a cruel and unusual torture device, and bangles and baubles that tempt cats into tearing out our earlobes. Have you stopped to wonder why the cats haven't been in videos lately meowing around my feet? It's cause I closed the door, cause I started wearing earrings, and I'm scared for my life. And more expensive can either mean more rare, or also more difficult or time consuming to craft. In the time before machines, fancy beadwork and intricate fabrics almost always meant that the item was very expensive. Purple was considered a royal color because for a very long time, the only source of purple dye was sea snails. And you had to boil 250,000 of the poor bastards just to get an ounce of usable dye. So the next time you're swooning over some purple clad royal character in some drama, think of all the snails that would have theoretically had to die to make that character look that sexy. Was it worth it? The answer becomes yes once you remember that that's just an actress wearing a costume that was probably dyed with synthetic pigments created in a lab somewhere. Or is that what the modern snail murderers want you to think? Next up, uniforms and workwear. Clothing has long been used as a clear way to identify certain people. In modern days, you see doctors wearing lab coats, business women wearing suits, wizards wearing robes. Does the profession require presentation? If so, there's gonna be a strong design aspect. Is it hard labor? Then the most important thing is gonna be durability and maybe even washability. In Aletheia, the main characters are essentially slaves and prisoners. Six of the seven divisions are color-coded because it makes it easier for the overseers to see if people are in their proper labor areas. But Division 7 goes out into the ruins where a bright color would say, come eat me, and not in a good way. Yeah, there's a good way. So they have dark green pants and dark gray tops, which helps blend into the ruins which are being overtaken by nature. It's also worth noting that workwear can become fashion wear over time. Don't believe me? Look in your drawer. I bet you there is a pair of jeans in there. And the very first pair of jeans ever created was created by Levi Strauss in my home state of California. And more specifically, it was created for gold miners during the gold rush. They were designed for durability. Most jeans, to this day, still have the little copper rivets in their pockets and seams. And the purpose of those was to make sure the seams held better because these clothes were being beat to hell. Next up, ceremonial garb. One of the things that you need to keep in mind for this is that ceremonial garb is more often than not very symbolic. If you have people who are born mermaids and they slowly grow legs and by their 18th birthday it's considered their naming day and they walk on land for the first time, they likely wear clothing that plays with their shift from sea to land. Maybe they'd start off in a dress that looks like the sea with blues and greens and pearls that are woven to look like a splash of sea foam and as they walk out of the water in the ceremony they take off the dress and they walk onto land naked so they can show off their brand new legs. And also remember that symbolism can be manufactured. The reason that diamond engagement rings became a thing isn't some deep cultural connection to diamonds, but rather a bunch of mining companies coming together to create De Beers Consolidated Mining Company, then hiring the marketing company N.W. Ayers, who started working towards presenting diamonds as a symbol of everlasting love. Now, years later, no one remembers the ads, but the tradition remains and many of us assume that there's a deep cultural root to it. Granted, capitalism has sort of become a part of the culture in the US, and that is sad. And that is why I write fantasy and sci-fi. So I can write my own sad and twisted traditions, cause that's what I do for fun. So there you have it. Some of these things you might not have time to explore on paper, but they could help you brainstorm a unique clothing for your people. And if you have a setting far removed from what we accept as normal, you're gonna wanna show that they do at least wear different clothing. If you want to see more on world building, I will link a playlist in the description down below where I cover all sorts of world building type things. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Stay away.